everybody. I'm Joshua. I'm Caleb. I don't want to do this episode. I don't want to do Josh. this episode either. We it's started just... this series. I didn't even have a beard. <laughs> by, the time we're, by the time we're done with this, I'm going to be Methuselah, the yeah. sucker. We're going to have to rip off the Band-Aid. I, like, mean... I know that every one of you at home loves talking about Harry Potter and all the <laughs> wonderful things that uh, you let your children do that are demon-like, but... Uh, I don't want to have to, I'm going to have to burst all your bubbles today. We're going to go through them yeah. in nauseam. Well, last week we spoke about the Nakash, and this week we're going to speak about the spirit of the Nakash, how it's linked to enchantment and sorcery and divination, because Satan has created all these alternate uh, counterfeit points of power, and uh, they're in direct opposition to the true power that Yeshua has given us. But you may be scratching your head wondering, how, why is this connected to creation and the creation saga? I'm glad you asked. Why is that? Because magic is anti-creation. God is creation, God is life, and magic is death and destruction. And so we have to look at the counterfeit, what Satan is offering with the occult and with evil, and things you may not even think you're a part of, but have, you know, kind of nudged into society as being acceptable. It's, it's kind of sad. Well, that is the scary part of it, yeah. is that it, it, it gets you to accept it over time. It trickles into your life. Uh, the Greek New Testament term for what we're going to discuss is pharmakia. Oh, pharmakia, that's one point of it, sorcery, and that is using drugs to alter the state of mind, um, to accept uh, demonic, you know, entities and spirits and to torment you. It's interesting, Josh, that, you know, we've talked before about the fall of the Benai Elohim, how they made it with the daughters of men and created this race of Nephilim. But according to many ancient Jewish sources, that the Benai Elohim also taught magic to mankind. They taught drugs, they taught sorceries, they understood the science of God's creation, so they were going to create the anti-creation and teach man how to take part in it. So wait a minute, yeah. if the fallen Benai Elohim were the ones who taught everybody how to do magic, it can't be bad at all. No, there no, must no, be no. nothing wrong with that. Well, let's get into this. Deuteronomy 18, 9 through 11 says, when you enter the land which the Lord your God gives you, you shall not learn to imitate the detestable things of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or daughter pass through the fire, one who uses divination, one who practices witchcraft, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who casts a spell, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. Well, you don't may, do it. You may be saying none of this stuff is real, magic is not real, the Bible takes it seriously. These works of darkness is real, and, and Satan uh, utilizes that in opposition to God. And we're going to go through uh, the literal occupations, dark occupations that Satan created to work his will on the earth in opposition to God. And the first is May Nakesh. It's rooted in Nakash. We all talked about the serpent, and it literally means a sorcerer, a diviner, one who hisses, whispers, or utters enchantments uh, to divine or interpret omens. Uh, it's, it's, so somebody who studies things like the flight patterns of birds, the signs of the heavens and the sky, listens to the sounds of nature, yeah, to goes, try to, I know what this is I'm saying. I'm looking at the sky, oh, Hold what's on. the meaning behind this omen? And, and uh, Yeshua himself spoke against this because uh, the Pharisees took part in this. Matthew 16, 1 through 4, then the Pharisees and Sadducees came and testing him, asked that he would show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said to them, when it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather for the sky is red and in the morning it will be foul weather today for the sky is red and threatening. Hypocrites, you know how to discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. Wow, this, you know, the, the Pharisees and Sadducees, they were the church of that day. They were the religious ruling elite and, and that kind of enchantment had uh, taken its way into that ruling power and Yeshua was against it. And it's interesting, you know, Josh, even today, what Judaism today is quite different from what it was back then. I believe when, it. when they had the temple and they could worship God and offer sacrifices, but after 70 AD, the temple was destroyed. And so the rabbis had to create new systems, you know, new patterns of worship, new things. And it has become an encroachment in modern Judaism today, uh, mysticism. Kabbalah, the text called the Zohar, uh, which looks at, at uh, obtaining knowledge and revelation in little things, you know, like, like reading of the palm. 
So you look at the, the creases and the lines on your palm. You've heard of palm readers, you know. This comes uh, from the Hebrew term meonin, fortune tellers or omen readers. Uh, that has become a scourge in Judaism today, yeah. such as crystal ball readers, you know. We have a palms down policy in my house. <laughs> Ain't nobody falling into that nonsense. But all, all this has opened the doorway for the, the enemy to come in and torment and oppress you. This uh, lets you take part in witchcraft and divination and sorcery and all these different things. Um, and how many of us do that today? You may say, I, I don't go see palm readers or fortune tellers or stuff like that. Um, but just as the Pharisees were testing Yeshua, you know, we test God every day. Uh, we may not be able to hear the still small voice of the Holy Spirit because we've let sin in our lives and distractions and all these things. So we kind of throw down the gauntlet and we say, God, do you want me to do this? You know, if, if you know, this happens, then it's of you. I'm going to do this anyways. And if it's not of you, then, you know, you won't be in that. And that's testing God, I think. I think it is. And I think I wouldn't do it. Yeah. Well, that, that takes us to the next uh, demonic position, a kosim. Oh, Kasim is another word for diviner in Hebrew, a more all-encompassing term to include interpreter of omens, to divine by tokens, and direct communication with spirits. This one, you know, he discovers the past, present, and future in, in, in hidden things and in discussing things with spirits. And we see uh, that Balaam, 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 was, Balaam, was, the Balaam was a diviner. He was a sorcerer. You know that story, right? I do. And it's in Numbers 22. Balaam, the diviner, he was hired. He was given some monies, yeah. right, to interpret the future. Uh, uh, they wanted him to he curse wanted to the Israelites. Curse the Israelites. But I'm saying for his, for his job. He interpreted. He interpreted things. And, things for them. and so he was sent to do that. And it didn't go exactly the way he <laughs> planned for it God to go. God kind of stopped him, you know, with his own donkey speaking to him, say, hey, buddy, you have no idea what's going on. And uh, he did obey Yahweh. He didn't curse the Israelites. He blessed them. But he still reviled in the Bible as a wicked man. Right. Yeah, we see that in Scripture. Second Peter 2.15, they have forsaken the right way and gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. And Balaam didn't learn his lessons. As we know in, in Scripture, um, after that moment, he, yeah, he blessed the Israelites, but then he told Israel's enemies, you know, I can't curse them, but if you want their God to turn against them and judge them, then get them to sin against our God. So they took a bunch of uh, uh, really pretty girls and sent them into the camp, and people had sex with them, and they, they sinned against God. <laughs> How come, how come in the Bible so many times like, I've got a plan. Let's go have sex with them. Get the it, hot women. It's, it's terrible, but we see the same spirit of divination connected to Balaam in Revelation when Yeshua warns the church of Pergamum, you've fallen into the same sin as Balaam, the sorcerer. Revelation 2.14, but I have a few things against you because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, divination, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. So we sin in that same way uh, when we eat food sacrificed to idols. Well, we put idols in our lives, things that we can't live without, things that feed us daily. Oh, I got to... I got to, you know, play this video game or have this alcohol. I don't know. It could be simple anything, things that makes it an Anything in your life that yes. you put before the Father. And that becomes our daily bread when the Word should be our daily bread. And as we've spoken about before, sexual immorality doesn't mean you have to commit adultery. It could be in your heart, like Yeshua said. Right in there. If you did it in your heart, if you thought about it, if you dwelt on it, That's you've right. done it. Anyways, that will lead us to our next position of darkness. I know you've been waiting for the Sheol Ob. <laughs> Any, let me just say, anytime some form of anything involves Sheol, it's bad. <laughs> it's not good. You're getting down seventh layer, layer of hell bad right there. It ain't good. Uh, this is a consulter of demons, and Ob is a soothsaying demon. These people talk directly to evil spirits, and such spirits possess their mind. Yeshua mentioned, you know, uh, if you keep your house empty and clean, then a bunch of spirits are going to shack up in there. You know, he said so in Matthew 12, 43, uh, 45. But these demons are unclean spirits. They're the departed spirits of the Nephilim that go about on the earth. Jude called them wandering spirits. They seek to find habitation in mankind, anything that they can live vicariously through and sin through. But God warns the Israelites, don't follow in that sin of Sheol. Oh. Leviticus 20, 27, a man or woman who is a medium or who has familiar spirits shall surely be put to death. They shall stone them with stones. Their blood shall be upon them. So these familiar spirits become co-leaders with man, you know, in imparting uh, knowledge and wisdom. They, they work codependently 
uh, with each other and you see that they are also linked with the Nakash spirit. Um, because we see the slave girl diviner in the New Testament is said that she has the spirit of the python, the snake spirit upon her. Ugh. Acts 16, 16 through 19. Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with the spirit of divination, the spirit of Python, met us, who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. The girl followed Paul and us and cried out saying, these men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. Man, let me just tell you, if you're, <laughs> if you're getting that annoying that yeah. Paul himself was like, enough! Get out! <laughs> yeah, you know, these fortune tellers use these spirits to relay fake futures and fake knowledge and fake wisdom. Yeah, this one time she was telling the truth. Yeah, these guys lead the way of salvation, but usually it's a lie. You know, this is also known as a Yodoni in Hebrew, a soothsayer, a knowing one. And even today, people consult mediums and, and spiritists to be intermediaries between them and the spirit world. Even Christians do that today. I know it's sad. Like some people pay $5 an hour at 1-900-CLEO or Miss yeah, Cleo. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and you may think, oh, we don't take part in that today. But when you use um, anybody, anything as an intermediary between you and God, whether it's your pastor or a priest or the Pope, you can go directly to God because we can do so by the blood of Yeshua, um, but you're using someone else, you're dependent on someone else to hear from God for you. And it's okay to get prayed for every, you know, once in a while have someone, you know, speak a prophetic word in your life, but if your dependency is on man and not on God, you have a problem. I think in two episodes, you just renamed a woman's period and said the Pope's unnecessary. <gasps> this Don't is fantastic. <laughs> All right, next, next, you want to read this next? Oh, you, oh in Hebrew? Ken, Caleb wants me to read the Hebrew, so I'll embarrass myself now. Uh, Doresh el Hamathin. Hamathin, yeah, yeah. Ha Hamathin, all right, Doresh el Hamathin. This is a necromancer, a yeah. seeker of the dead. Uh, literally a medium who summons spirits of the dead for guidance. Like the Witch of Endor like in scripture, the, you know? So the little, the little cute fuzzy bears, the ones that look like tiny, um, tiny, uh, Teddy bears? Uh, oh, Return of the Jedi? Yeah, the, we're talking about those little guys? No, the ones like, <laughs> no, no, like, different. <laughs> and they were like eating the little stuff. And... A, a different indoor. Um, oh. You should know the Bible story related to this that we're going to talk about. Saul, the first king of Israel, sinned greatly against God. Sin of witchcraft and divination, God says, he in rebellion against me. God. And so God says, you're not going to be king any longer. I'm not going to speak to you. And, and Saul's, you know, the, his favorite prophet who, who chose him, Samuel, is dead. He has no one to speak to. And there's a big battle coming up. Saul's like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? At the beginning of Saul's reign, he outlawed witchcraft and sorcery under the penalty of death, as he should. But now he's going to go and he's going to find a witch and ask her to perform a seance to summon the departed spirit of Samuel to ask the departed spirit of Samuel to ask God if he's going to die in battle the next day. I just want to really quickly, before I read this scripture, <laughs> bubble wrap this concept. First king of Israel. Yeah. He was put up, put in there by Samuel. Oh all right. Gosh. He starts doing bad things. Samuel is dead. He thinks, I got to ask go Samuel for help by bringing a witch to call him back from the dead to give me an answer from God. True man of genius. And I know not. what I find interesting, though, is this witch is used to speaking to her familiar spirits right. who pose as departed spirits of loved ones and give revelation. Well, uh, you know, she goes through with this for, for Saul. Saul disguises himself, yeah, yeah. you know. So remember, Saul was head and shoulders of everybody, but he disguised himself really well. Yeah. And, and 1 Samuel 28, 12 through 15 says, When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice. And the woman spoke to Saul, saying, why have you deceived me? For you are Saul. And the king said to her, do not be afraid. What did you see? And the woman said to Saul, I saw a spirit ascending out of the earth. So he said to her, what is his form? And she said, an old man is coming up and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel. And he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed down. Now Samuel said to Saul, why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? The, the woman, the witch, was terrified. She was expecting to speak to her familiar spirit, but God silenced the familiar spirit. He sent the real Samuel there. Man, that's that's even that you know that to put it into y'all's perspective, yeah. it's not like this, but that's like Yoda coming up and being like, "Bring me back, why did you?" You know, dude, that's like hardcore stuff yeah, right there. Yeah, and Samuel had bad news. You're gonna die in battle the next day. Yeah. So. I'm here. I don't know why I'm here. You're gonna die. 
I'm out. That leads us to the next uh, position of darkness. Uh, Chober, Chaber, a binder of a band or a spell. This individual would speak an incantation or spell to bring a demon to them. And though they believe they trap said spirit, you know, like a genie in a bottle, that, that spirit has bound them in chains in the spirit world. They can't see that. And they create charms or amulets or uh, to trap evil spirits or ward evil spirits like away. Like garlic, right? Like you garlic to a vampire. vampire. That's right. You know, oh, I got my, you know, they also made teraphim, which we're going to talk about anyways, but these, these you know, amulets and charms and things like that. These were big talismans uh, back then. And they started off, you see in archaeology, uh, uh, the times of Israel, archaeologists have discovered snake charms or amulets that people would wear around their necks, rest on their nope. shoulders, rings that look like Nakash, the serpent. You know, it's kind of interesting that it's all linked back to the Nakash. Huh? All of the charms These are serpents. Charms. Very interesting. Yeah. But guys, uh, we see this today in society, uh, things like pentagrams that people will wear around their necklaces. That's right. If you've ever seen somebody with a dream catcher in their car, oh, yeah. uh, I, I know we think these are no big deal, but these are symbolic of these talismans that are inviting spiritual That's forces right. to come and jack with you and you don't want that. And spirits can become attached to these if people uh, put their focus on these and, and use these as forms of worship. Demons can abs absolutely be attached to them uh, and they can lead you into sin and destruction and bondage. We don't want yes. that. Matthew 18, 18 through 20 says, Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by the Father in heaven. For where there are two or three gathered together in my name, I am in the midst of them. So that's the true power that you're supposed to have to bind evil spirits. You'll need a talisman to bind an evil spirit. Get out of here, talisman. I mean, we, you just don't have to worry about it. But that, that brings us to teraphim. I know me, many people find this confusing. They see the term teraphim in scripture. They think it's an idol, idolatry, but it's so much more than that. Um, the long gone theologian G.H. Pember from like the 1800s, this man was a genius um, in studying the Hebrew and studying, you know, all the supernatural that's listed in the Bible. I use him for a lot of my references. But he understood uh, that the root for teraphim goes back to the Chaldean language, which got it from the Egyptian language. And ter means, uh, it signifies a shape, a type, or a transformation. So this was linked um, as a representation of your departed spirits. That's where you get the mummy from, uh, you know, the Egypt. departed, you know, uh, things that you form to represent your ancestors. And so the Israelites would have um, these spellbinders create teraphim, these mini idols. They would set up a shrine in their house, you know, to worship, to incorporate, to to always pray to their ancestors. You see that ancestor uh, kind of worship going on today in the Eastern religions. In, in the, I'm sorry, I say the Catholic Church. Um, any uh, liturgical orthodoxy where you light a candle. Day of the Dead. Day of the Dead. Uh, uh, you know, with uh, South American cultures, even Native American cultures have that same similar ancestor worship. It, it still carries on today. Mm, I'm not pronouncing this next one. Wait, wait, you can't say that? Can't say it. Makasha Chef? <laughs> I think it's Makasha. It's so bad at this. It's a, it's a literal enchantress, a witch or a wizard, someone who prays to demons and uses witchcraft, speaking magic words and incantations. Hmm. I mean, Harry Potter. <laughs> Harry Potter. <laughs> well, how, how about you know you know how Satan likes to dress up evil in yeah. a nice pretty package? You Maybe know these beautiful. movies like Frozen. I I know I just. Oh, snap. Made everybody, and I just took it one step further. <laughs> oh. It's okay because it's a musical. My girls love it, and she's a good witch and all that. Is that why the um, cold never bothered her anyway? She was evil. Yeah. <laughs> but speaking these magic words uh, holds power. And, and you may say, I'm not speaking magic words. I'm not an enchantress, a witch, or a wizard. But when we use our tongues for evil, it's the same thing. It holds the same power in. And James, the brother of Yeshua, warned us of this. James 3 6. And the nine and ten. The tongue also is a fire, a word of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and it itself set on fire by hell. Verse nine. With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come blessing and cursing. Yeah, Proverbs 18, 21 says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Uh, this is the same thing, guys. You know in comedies people may joke, a pox upon your head is like a medieval, you know, insult. Dang poxes. But there's, there's real power in those words. These are real curses that can be spoken, and even in church, 
uh, gossip and slander. You know, you may say, everybody get together, we're going to pray for so-and-so who fell into sin, whatever. You're speaking these negative things over someone. I, we, we need to pray for Susie. She is a dirty tramp, and Lord, deliver her from her ways and her mistresses. And But you're, you're spreading these curses with your lips, and, and Yeshua takes it another step further in Matthew 5, 33-35. Again, you have heard that it is said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by earth, for it is his footstool. Hmm. Well, so, well, well, there's no safe place to swear by because you don't own it. <laughs> there's, be, be careful when you make promises and oaths. Just ask Jephthah in the Bible, look it up. It's a biblical burn right there. Poor Jephthah. That was the worst oath ever. <laughs> but you, you gotta be careful when you make these vain promises and, and swear by things. And it literally places you or someone else under an enchantment. Um, back then they had blood oaths, blood brothers, you know. Well, you get um, part of these clubs, right? Freemasons, Knights of Columbus, Scottish Rites. You, you know, um, Illuminati, Ordo Templi Orientis, Sisters of the Eastern Star. Um, joining these clubs, you speak these oaths, you swear these promises, and it, it literally places you and your family members under a curse and, and it becomes a generational curse. We spoke about generational curses years ago. Yes, we did. Um, four generations. And it's uh, yeah, it's an inclination uh, that passes on through your bloodline uh, to commit a certain sin. You may not be committing that sin, but you are you're being pulled that way um, and it warns you of that in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 5, 9, you shall not bow down to them or worship them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation to those who hate me. Yeah. These general uh, generational curses, like you said, they can be inclinations, things like um, uh, to lust, you lust uh, alcohol, to hate, to alcohol, all these things, anything like that. and it passes on through your family line unless you break it yep. by the power of the blood of Yeshua. And that's why these like secret societies that Josh mentioned, they're very dangerous because you swear an oath that affects you and your family's generations. Uh, in Freemasons, binding myself, you're putting yourself in change, binding myself under no less penalty, having my, my tongue ripped out by its roots, my entrails cut out and burned, it, it, terrible things, placing myself under a plague and under curse and death and destruction. And you don't want the, to do that. And, and these people, we just, we're kind of like scaring them away. They're like, I'm not part of these secret societies. Yeah, like, but that doesn't apply to me. No, no, no that stuff church. doesn't happen in the church where I go it to. It doesn't happen in a way in the church. But yet we still have groups in the church. Notice that the segregation that hit the, hit the church comes in different ways. We've spoken okay. about this before as well. All of a sudden we have a men's group. It's designated only to speak about things yeah. that only men can handle and only men can overcome. The women's okay. group, the children's group, uh, you know, they're all the different groups that seem like a good idea. Yet they bring segregation, yeah. yet they give a, a group a mantra that we swear by. Now we're swearing by our manhood. We're all together. Only men understand yeah. and only men can fix. Same with women. We, I know you think we're making it sound super bad and we're dissing on your group because you don't want to talk about your naughty parts in front of the other gender. <laughs> But God and God created the family unit for a reason together, to, be to be divided. together, to overcome together, yeah. and, and to draw closer through those that process. Yeah, and the spirit of divination divides it. Anyways, let's let's go on to our next uh, worker of I darkness. I can say this one. All right, tell me. Itum. Itim. Yeah. Oh come on, no, no, man. It's fine. <laughs> Heavy eyes. Itim. Okay, and as a charmer, a whisperer, a mutterer, those who repeat spells and charms. I think this is where Harry Potter, you know, his magic. You know, <laughs> He's all of them. Harry Potter's everyone on here. <laughs> magic spells that you whisper. Um, I believe snake charmers falls under this category. People who place others under hypnosis. You use specific words to to activate things and place them under a trance so that uh, spirits can oppress them and bring them into bondage. Um, people who meditate, you know, you may say, I'm trying to find my peaceful center. That's that's rooted in Eastern mysticism no. and Buddhism. And I'm just going to do my yoga and, instead. Yoga is totally safe. I'm, not, I'm I, a Christian. There's Christian it's, yoga, is there not? It's Christian yoga. I'm very flexible. I can put goats on myself. But, but that form of meditation, they you're, put goats on them now too. You're bending your body into geometric shapes and patterns, opening spiritual gateways for the enemy to oppress you. You really think it's it's good to bow to the sun? That that position, bowing to it's. There's demonic connections with that. Um, but even so, we see that in the church today uh, in, in you know, men and women who, who speak um, predetermined prayers, prayers, predetermined prayers, chants, 
uh, that everybody's used to, the same things you repeat over and over again. Things, things that become mantras and bypass the heart yeah. and just become these things that we recite and we rely on the recitation of them as opposed to actually yes. the communication and the belief in them is what we're saying. Yeah. Now, Matthew 5, 6, and 7 says, And when you pray, do not use vain repetition as heathens do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Jews are very big on this. Catholics are very big on this. Um, God said to avoid that vain repetition. What does vain mean in Hebrew? Uh, it just means empty, mindless. You're shutting off your mind. Um, you're used to this repetitive jargon and you just repeat something out of instinct over and over again, just like, you know, a sorcerer repeats a spell over and over again. And uh, we're supposed to pray to God like he's our daddy. You know, we're just talking to him. It's open communication with him. And Yeshua said, don't pray like these people. They're reciting these prayers over and over again. Um, the only thing you should be repeating with repetition is the word of God. You should be memorizing that and, and reciting that. Uh, but all these other prayers of man, it, it kind of gets you into a gray area. This next one? Okay, what, what do we got? Is it Charlander or is that a Pokemon <laughs> or something like that? Ch Chartumum, like the Cardamom? Ch Chartumin? Chartumin. Um, Wise men or sacred scribes. This is the name given to the wise men in Egypt um, in the time of Moses and the wise men of the Chaldeans in Daniel's day. This is also a title given to spirit writers, those who surrender to a spirit hand, a demon that they allow to write on their stead. And there's, there's a modern use of that, uh, board games that they try to push on children. The, what is that board called? It's called the Ouija board. The Ouija board, yeah. It's bad news, don't have it. And that's surrendering yourself over to the enemy. They get to write a secret message and enchantment for you. Um, and we have another name for those, for those uh, wise men, those wizards, Charcommon. Char another name for wise hey, men. You struggle, good job. <laughs> But I, I still marvel how God can use the wicked to declare his glory. You see with Daniel and his three friends who were inducted into Wiseman's School in Babylon, and they were exposed to some pretty gnarly dark arts, but they stayed true to the Lord. And when uh, they rescued the wise men from annihilation, uh, the wise men held them in high esteem. They became the leaders and they taught the wise men the scriptures. And when they came looking for the Messiah uh, that was born, uh, they quoted scriptures to King Herod. They knew the truth. So, um, but the different story of the, the wicked uh, wise men, Giannis and Yambres, uh, with Moses, you know, throwing down that, that serpent, you know, the stick that becomes a Nakash. Exodus 7, yeah. 10 through 12. So Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh and they did so just as the Lord commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants and it became a serpent. But Pharaoh also called his wise men and the sorcerers, so the magicians of Egypt, that they also did in like manner and with their enchantments. For every man threw down his rod and they became serpents, but Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. Oh, that's awesome. Oh, yeah. The true power of God, but still they were able to mimic yep. the power of God and use real magic, the dark arts, to make their their uh, staffs turn into Nakashuses, you know, in the same Ooh, way. They mimic the, the first cache. two plagues. <laughs> yeah, they, they mimic the first two plagues and then God put a stop to them. But it's important that, that God was showing that Nakash uh, that Moses threw down because the Egyptians worshiped many snake deities. The, the snake that represented uh, chaos, the snake God that represented the underworld, and the chief snake being of all, the Uraeus, which was the cobra, which you saw would, uh, the, the Pharaoh would wear on his head. On his head that? Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah, though, though the magicians tried to use uh, their power, God still showed his dominance and they, they couldn't do it any longer. Well, let's discuss now, lastly, the astrologers, okay. the okay. stargazers, heaven dividers, horoscope predictors. You gonna read those names in Hebrew or? Nope, I'm gonna let you do that part. I was hitting the, the Gasrim, the Hobre Shamaim, Hosim, Bakacho Habim, Modim, Legodashim. Okay. Sounds delicious. All these guys, you know, they look to the heavens uh, for wisdom, uh, using the dark arts to make predictions of the birth of important people. It's all about the stars, determining the fate of man as foretold in the stars, having your horoscopes read, um, your fortunes read. The wise men were big on this. Uh, they looked to the stars and they, well, they did find a star that led them all the way to Yeshua's birth. But this is merely thinly veiled idolatry, worshiping the heavens. And God says, don't do it. Deuteronomy 4.19, and when you look up in the sky and see the sun, the moon, and the stars, all the heavenly array, do not be enticed into bowing down to them and worshiping things the Lord your God has appointed to all the nations under heaven. So those same dark arts are practiced today, like we said, with horoscopes and people may, may not think it's a big deal. And the, what's your sign? This is my sign. Um, people look to omens in the stars, the alignments of planets. 
Uh, there's high holy days that many religions worship on, the summer and winter solstices, on the equinoxes, um, the May days, you know, and, and all these different things. Uh, they're just demonic parties over the years that have carried on through the centuries. God says, don't do it. And putting your faith in these things will be brought to nothing. Isaiah 47, 13 and 14 says, all the counsel you have received has only worn you out. Let your astrologers come forward, those stargazers who make predictions month by month. Let them save you from what is coming upon you. Surely they are like stubble. The fire will burn them up. Oh, that was a lot of evil positions that we just read about. Um, but in America today, we think we've become so civilized that all these, you know, archaic and weird forms of worship, they don't exist. We're intelligent. We have advancements in, in technology and in science. We don't use those magic spells and enchantments on everyday objects. None of our logos are in any way demonic. Yeah, I mean, we see it in marketing, guys. We honestly see it in everyday things in our entertainment that we feed ourselves with in our music. It's hidden everywhere, it who's honestly that, is. Who's that lady on the Starbucks cut? <laughs> the goddess Asherah, you know, on Starbucks. She's the goddess of sexuality and war and fertility. And, and we don't know that we're, we're programming our minds with these things, I mean. You didn't know you liked their coffee because it's sexy and fertile. I mean, that's marketing says so sex sells, you know, that's the chief marketing thing. And, and people don't know that that's infiltrated um, even in our children's games and their books and movies trying to seduce them under these various forms of enchantment. And all this is under um, 1 John 2.16, where it's warned that the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life uh, tempts us in all these different ways to put us under bondage. And, and I, I've had to raise my children, yes. you know, to put on the full armor of God and not to be moved by these things of darkness, even in simple things at Halloween time. The most powerful thing you can do is turn your eyes away from evil. So just don't look at the evil, guys. Don't give it glory. You know, we don't have to be afraid of it, you know, all the, the dark imagery, but when you, there's power when you don't look at evil. It, it well, just uses it. Just look what he, he said to a lot and his your wife, don't look back. That's right. Look back at the destruction yes. turned to salt. That's right. Look forward and live. Where yes. you put your focus means so much. Yes. Why do you think Paul said, forgetting what's behind, I look forward. That's right. Where you put your gaze is eventually going to keep your attention. It's going to get inside of you. That's it's right. going to guide your steps because that's what, we, that's what you're literally looking at and putting your focus on. But this, this is going to continue, guys. It's not going away. It's going to continue to try and indoctrinate our children until the point in the tribulation where the, the beast is going to work signs and wonders and the false prophet will enchant a, a idol to come to life and people won't be moved. They're just going to be, oh yeah, that's cool. You know, I've seen this stuff in video games. Let's follow that guy. He's really awesome. You know, <laughs> it's going to happen. But James 4, 7 and 8, therefore submit to God, yes. resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Yeah, I just like to say, yeah. we're no longer double-minded believers, right? We claim to serve God, it's time to serve God. Yes, right, the, the, put away the old things. Put away the old things, put away the evil. And straight up, normally I'm the guy here that's like, let me make it all nice for you, and Caleb's the one that's like, rah, 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 rah. but this, this stuff matters. Mm -hmm. And we spend so much time, good, God-loving and fearing Christians spend so much time trying to justify the stuff that we put in our system and the stuff we let our kids do. Yeah. Half the time it's because we're lazy. We don't want to have to sit and occupy our kids' time. We don't want oh, to have to true. discipline yes. them when they do something wrong. It's yeah. a lot easier to send them in front of the video game that's sucking them into another reality or to put them in front of these other movies that are full of this and that because Disney's cool and it likes them. We're giving in to what the flesh likes through them to make it easier on our flesh. Shame on us. Now, whether or not you think it's a big deal or we're being legalistic to call out things like Frozen and Harry Potter and all these wonderfully marketed creatures that you think are no big deal, it's not that bad. You stand before Jesus one day and tell him that. You've been placed in charge of those kids. It falls on you. It doesn't fall on somebody else. So the way you should be looking at it is if there is even an inkling, a small possibility, if anything we've said today and anything in that Bible even points to the direction that those things are not of God, that something could be in the influence, purview, or control of your child, of you, anything taking your gaze away from the Father, it has no place and I'm getting it out. Mm. Not for the sake of legalism, not for the sake of any other reason, but that I serve one and one only, and that is the Son of the living God, Yeshua. So I, I, I challenge you today, take a look at what you're letting raise your kids. Yeah. 
it's super easy to give them the iPhone and the iPad and all the other pa devices. It's super easy for them to go and say, well, the Fortnite and the this and the that, it's not that bad. I'm just playing with my friends. It's fantasy. Mm -hmm. It's taking them out of reality. It's, it's preventing them from becoming disciplined children that choose what is right and putting their flesh at bay. It's feeding the wrong thing. It's time that we do what is right, what is not easy, what is a narrow path choice that is going to lead us into the men and women of God that we were designed, called to be, oh yeah, and sacrificed for. Mm. I love you guys. This is on the internet. I know you can pull off all kinds of things and make it sound super bad. And if you ever see me going to a movie that's Disney, y'all can all say, look, there's Josh saying Disney's bad and going to a movie. We're not perfect. I'm not asking you to be. I'm asking you to make changes and to put in your heart what is right so that God will honor you for honoring him. Simply that. I'm glad we got rid of this. We pulled the Band-Aid off. My goodness, 47 minutes later, you're so welcome. And finally, next week, we're going to talk about the good, the final episode of our creation saga, the glory of God. Guys, I hope you join us next time, especially after this episode. <laughs> I still love you. Oh, goodness.